Lecture 11, Mormonism. Beginning with Mormonism, these last two lectures will focus on an interreligious context. Catholic responses to the following Mormon teachings will be presented in this lecture. The Great Apostasy, Eternal Progression, and the Extra-Biblical Public Revelation. We will conclude with reflection on recent developments within Mormon theology that may be bringing Mormon doctrine closer to Catholic belief. The Great Apostasy. According to the Mormon elder Gary Coleman, from the time of Adam and Eve up, apostasies have been frequently occurring. After each, in, each apostasy, God responded by inspiring prophets to restore the true teaching that was completely lost in each apostasy. Even after the coming of Jesus Christ, apostasies continue to occur. This explains why in the New Testament there are no further scripture passages after Revelation chapter 22. This absence of further inspired books after Revelation chapter 22 is due to God's decision to restrict further revelation and prophecy to his people at the time Revelation was written because yet another apostasy called the Great Apostasy had occurred. During the 19th century, God inspired the prophet Joseph Smith to restore his true teaching that had been completely lost during the Great Apostasy. Through Joseph Smith, God revealed additional teaching intended for all people that are not contained in the New Testament. Joseph Smith was given these revelatory truths by God in a similar way as Moses, Abraham, and even Christ received revelation. Members of Joseph Smith's church, the Church of the Latter-day Saints, Continue God's mission of restoring truth and transmitting new revelatory truth. So that's what Coleman presents Mormonism as. In a dialogue with Mormon, Coleman, Patrick Madrid responded to the Mormon doctrine of the great apostasy as follows. Both the Mormon Church and the Catholic Church claim to be the true Church. However, there only can be one true Church. Mormonism uses the Bible to support its claim that Mormonism is the true church. The passages they use come from a canon recognized by the Catholic Church. The passages they refer to are also situated in a scriptural context which explicitly dismisses a central claim of Mormonism, that a great apostasy occurred shortly after Jesus' life on earth. Since Christ promised that his church will not apostatize by being completely overcome, and because Christ is not a liar, how could a great apostasy have occurred if we believe in Christ? In Matthew 16, 18, Jesus promises Peter, You are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. A number of chapters later, in Matthew 28, 20, Jesus promises that, I am with you always, to the end of the age. In the Gospel of John, Jesus assures his disciples that although he may be absent from them in his bodily presence, he will be present spiritually, since the Holy Spirit will be with you forever. The Holy Spirit, explains Jesus, will guide you into all the truth. Simply because Jesus promised that his presence and the Holy Spirit will protect the church in the truth does not mean that the church will only be comprised of perfectly truthful people. In accordance with Jesus' parable of the weeds, the church does not deny that there were, are, and will be sinful, imperfect members in the church. Rather, the church teaches that Christ, because he is God and as God is true to his promises, the church and her official beliefs will never stray from truth into apostasy. A key means Jesus used to preser preserve truth in the church is apostolic succession, in particular the succession of the office of Peter. Acts 1, 24-26 describes the first instance of apostolic succession. And this is when they cast lots in order to determine who will replace Judas. And the lot fell on Matthias, and he was added to the eleven apostles. As the church continued her mission received by Christ of extending his presence through time, she began conferring apostolic succession upon others when they died. Look at 1 Timothy uh, at 4.14 and 5.22. Since the church is Christ's mystical body, it is not reasonable that Christ would allow his body to be subject to Satan by falling into total apostasy. 
Being more powerful than Satan, Christ will not allow his mystical body to be completely divorced from its head by falling into total apostasy. Scripture, though, does refer to partial apostasies of individuals and groups of within the church. Despite these partial apostasies, including some bishops, but never a pope in an official way, there has never been a general apostasy of the entire church. As early as the first century of Christianity, references are made in Christian literature to both apostolic succession and the primacy of the Pope as head of the successors to the apostles. In the letter to the Church of Corinth, Pope St. Clement I, and he reigned from 92 to 99, describes apostolic succession and settled a dispute within the Church of Corinth, even though he was the Bishop of Rome. Interestingly, although the Apostle John was alive, this was around circa, uh, he died around circa uh, 100 AD. He was not asked to settle this dispute. Instead, the Bishop of Rome was. The dispute within the Corinthian church was addressed to Pope St. Clement because although not one of the original 12 apostles, he was the Bishop of Rome and consequently was considered as having primacy over other sees. While documentary evidence of very early belief in apostolic succession and papal primacy exists, no documentary evidence exists that a general apostasy took place during these early days of Christianity. Finally, Madrid points out that the events that are to take place before the apostasy at the end of times, which Second Thessalonians refers to, have not yet occurred. Roman 11 identifies these as Gentiles coming into the church in their full number which will be followed by the salvation of all of Israel. Eternal Progression The Mormon doctrine of eternal progression is based on their henotheistic beliefs. Mormons believe that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are separate individual divine beings. This means that although Jesus is believed by Mormons to be God, he is understood by Mormons as literally a son of God, meaning that he is distinct from the Father and not one with the Father. Since Mormon belief entails believing in a plurality of gods, they do not consider themselves polytheists, but rather henotheists, since they worship one supreme god while accepting the existence of other gods. The doctrine of eternal progression teaches that not only does Jesus have a god who precedes him as his father, but also above his father is not another god. This pattern of succession is traced back to infinity and continues in the present. It continues in the present since all men are called to become divine, to become gods after the example of Jesus who once was a man and then became a god. Encountering Mormon henotheistic belief and the Mormon doctrine of eternal progression, Madrid argues that the Catholic Church has rightly defined God as one in accordance with scripture which teaches there are not many gods but only one God. The relational dimension of the one God called the Trinity is implicitly and explicitly taught in the Bible. Due to the rise of heresies, in the second century of Christian history, the teaching of God as three in one was clarified with the term Trinity. The first record we have of the word Trinity being used in a Christian context was by Bishop Theophilus of Antioch in his Apologia ad Articulum 181 AD. Theophilus used the Greek word for Trinity when referring to God the Father, God the Son as Logos, and God the Holy Spirit as Sophia. Later, the Latin father Tertullian, he lived from 160 to 255, 225 AD, used the Latin word Trinitas when referring to the three divine persons. According to Catholic belief in God as triune, God is being itself, ipsum esse, that by being itself, by being existence itself, is not caused. As existence itself, as the ground and foundation of all contingent dependent beings, God is the first cause of all beings. Contingent dependent beings cannot rely on an endless line of other prior dependent contingent beings for existence, since this would mean that all beings are receivers of existence. If all are only mere receivers of existence, then it is impossible for the reality of existence to be given. There must be one, at least one giver who didn't receive something before him. There must, therefore, be a necessary being itself that is the source of all being and did not receive its existence from anyone else. 
Simply the presence of people wanting to borrow books is not the necessary condition for a library that lends books. There first must be books to lend in order for people to receive and borrow the books. In this sense, God is like a divine librarian who loans us existence, which properly belongs to him alone. Catholics believe that the triune God wants to lend, wants to share his existence, since he is a communion of persons. With respect to the idea that there could be two or more infinite gods who give us existence, it is impossible for there to be two or more infinite grounds of all beings of existence itself, since these infinities would cancel each other out. If there were a number of infinite distinct beings, they would cancel each other out, since infinities cannot share infinity with one another without contradicting their infinite nature. Extra-Biblical Public Revelation According to the Mormon elder Frank Bradshaw, there can be and have been additional public revelations to the New Testament. Mormons believe that revelation comes from the Father through Jesus Christ and through the prophets, some of whom were born after Jesus Christ. One example of further public revelation that complements while not replacing the New Testament is, believe Mormons, the Book of Mormon. According to the introduction of the Book of Mormon, and I'm going to read, the Book of Mormon is a volume of Holy Scripture comparable to the Bible. It is a record of God's dealings with the ancient inhabitants of then Americas and contains the fullness of the everlasting gospel. The book was written by many ancient prophets by the spirit of prophecy and revelation. Their words written on gold plates were quoted and abridged by a prophet historian named Mormon. The record gives an account of two great civilizations. One came from Jerusalem in 600 BC and afterwards separated into two nations known as the Nephites and the Lamanites. The other came much earlier when the Lord confounded the tongues of the Tower of Babel. This group is known as the Jaredites. After a thousand years, thousands of years, all were destroyed except the Lamanites, and they are among the ancestors of the American Indians. The crowning event recorded in the Book of Mormon is the personal ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ among the Nephites soon after his resurrection. It puts forth the doctrines of the gospel, outlines the plan of salvation, and tells men what they must do to gain peace in this life and eternal salvation in the life to come. After Mormon completed his writings, he delivered the account to his son Moroni, who added a few words of his own and hid, up, hid the plates in the hill Cumorah. On September 21, 1823, the same Moroni, then a glorified resurrected being, appeared to the prophet Joseph Smith and instructed him relative to the ancient record and its destined translation into the English language. In due course, the plates were delivered to Joseph Smith, who translated them by the gift and power of God. The record is now published in many languages as a new and additional witness that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God, and that all who come unto him and obey the laws and ordinances of his gospel may be saved. Concerning this record, the prophet Joseph Smith said, I told the brethren that the Book of Mormon was the most correct of any book on earth and the keystone of our religion and a man would get nearer to God by abiding by its precepts than by any other book. In addition to Joseph Smith, the Lord provided for eleven others to see the gold plates for themselves and to be set special witnesses of the truth and divinity of the Book of Mormon. Their written testimonies are included herewith as the testimony of three witnesses and the testimony of eight witnesses. We invite all men everywhere to read the Book of Mormon, to ponder in their hearts the message it contains, and then to ask God, the Eternal Father, in the name of Christ, if the book is true. Those who pursue this course and ask in faith will gain a testimony of its truth and divinity by the power of the Holy Ghost. Those who gain this divine witness from the Holy Spirit will also come to know by the same power that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world, that Joseph Smith it is revelator and prophet in these last days, and that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is the Lord's kingdom once again established on earth, preparatory to the second coming of the Messiah. End of quote. In responding to Bradshaw, Madrid explained that we cannot teach a baby to tie his shoes, nor teach a baby proper table manners, since a baby does not yet have the capacity to understand our instructions. 
as the baby grows into a child and then into an adult, his capacity to understand and learn from his parents also ordinarily grows. Similarly, after the fall and expulsion from the Garden of Eden, humans underwent a process of development. Respecting this law of growth extended throughout history. God gradually imparted his teaching. Only at the fullness of time, when the time was right, did God send his Son as the fullness of revelation. After the coming of Jesus, there will be no further public revelation, since no prophet can surpass the revelation given through Jesus, who is the only Son of God. The Mormon difficulty of accepting that there can be a fullness of disclosure during a particular time in history is reflective of a modern approach to reality. In describing this modern mindset, Cardinal Avery Dulles writes, quote, The modern mind, deeply impressed by the limitations imposed by the particularities of time and culture, has difficulty in admitting that there can be any absolute or unsurpassable disclosure within history. Even thinkers who reject the inevitability of progress and deny that latter is better consider that each age may be able to surpass its predecessors in some respects and to equate revelation with an ancient deposit would condemn the church to a continual loss of vitality and actuality. Encountering this modern assumption, Vatican Council II pastorally explains Dulles, and I quote, avoided repeating the formula sometimes used that revelation ceased with the death of the last apostle. Instead, after describing Jesus as the perfecter and fulfillment of revelation, it stated this, the Christian dispensation, therefore, as the new and definitive covenant will never pass away, and we wait no further public revelation before the glorious manifestation of our Lord Jesus Christ. In the Constitution on the Church, Vatican II depicted the Church as capable of showing forth in the world the mystery of the Lord in a faithful, though shadowed way, until at last it will be revealed in total splendor. These two statements avoid giving the impression that the Church already possesses a total grasp of revelation in its fullness, but at the same time, they emphasize the Church's obligation to adhere faithfully to the mystery of the Lord, the Christian dispensation, the new and definitive covenant. Catholics, consequently, agree with Mormons that we can grow in understanding revelation given in its fullness through Jesus Christ. However, due to our belief that as the Son of God, Jesus perfected revelation by fulfilling it, there will be no further new public revelations before the manifestation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Concretely, this means that the Book of Mormon is not an inspired text that contains further public revelation. In arguing against the revelatory character of the Book of Mormon, Madrid points out that the Mormon belief that Jewish prophets and tribes lived in South America is not supported by any archaeological evidence and even contradicts archaeological data. For example, there's no archaeological evidence of a 400 AD battle that the Book of Mormon describes taking place in America between the Nephites and Lamanites, in which supposedly a half a million people died. It is highly reasonable to expect archaeologists would have discovered some evidence of this destructive battle, yet no such evidence exists. Textual evidence obtained from the Book of Mormon tends to discredit its authenticity as an inspired document. For example, Textual errors associated with the King James Bible from Joseph Smith's time are also present in the Book of Mormon. In addition, although the Book of Mormon describes horses in America before the Spanish arrived in the 1400s and 1500s, there's no evidence that horses existed prior to the arrival of the Spanish. Recent Developments in Mormonism According to Joseph Smith's teachings in Chapter 2, God the Eternal Father, and I quote, God himself was once as we are now, and is an exalted man, sits enthroned in yonder heavens. That is the great secret. If the veil were rent today, and the great God who holds this world in its orbit, and who upholds all worlds and all things by his power, was to make himself visible, I say, if you were to see him today, you would see him like a man in form, like yourselves in all the person, image, and very form as a man. For Adam was created in the very fashion, image, and likeness of God, 
and receive instruction from, and walk, talk, and converse with him, as one man talks and communes with another. End of quote. The close disciple of Joseph Smith, Lorenzo Snow, and fifth president of the Mormons, summarized Joseph Smith's teaching on eternal progression with, and I quote, As man now is, God once was. As God now is, man may be. According to the Mormon teacher support consultant, Gerald N. Lund, that although, quote, to my knowledge, there has been no official pronouncement by the First Presidency declaring that President Snow's couplet is to be accepted as doctrine, but that is not a valid criteria for determining whether or not it is doctrine. End of quote. Lund then cites numerous official Mormon sources that teach the doctrine which this couplet of Snow captures. Afterwards, Lund concludes with, quote, it is clear that the teaching of President Lorenzo Snow is both acceptable and accepted doctrine in the church today. End of quote. Lund's assertion appears to contradict the response of Gordon Hinckley, who was the president of the Mormon Church in 1997. In April of 1997, when Hinckley was asked if Snow's couplet is official doctrine, he responded with, quote, I wouldn't say that. There was a little couplet coined as man got as man is God once was. As God is, man may become. Now that's more of a couplet than anything else. That gets into some pretty deep theology that we don't know very much about. End of quote. In interpreting Hinckley's statement and other similar statements issued by Mormons, Richard J. Mao writes, Hinckley was singling a decision on the part of the Mormon leadership to downplay the snow couplet within the corpus of Mormon teachings about the deity, not just to outsiders, but within their own community. This suggests that contemporary Mormonism is interested in joining the broad Jewish and Christian consensus that God is ontologically different from man, or at least that Mormons today don't want to directly contradict that consensus. Again, we're faced with a choice. Will we approach Mormonism under the assumption that its theology is heretical beyond repair? Or will we adopt the more optimistic assumption that Mormonism is capable of self-reformation? End of quote. The questions that Mao raises are important ones when engaging with Mormonism. It is possible that Mormons are increasingly being open to the Holy Spirit's desire to reform their doctrines, to reform their church in accordance with the truths of Jesus Christ and his mystical body, the Catholic Church. When relating to Mormons, may we keep this in mind and encourage further reformation by Mormons with the hope they will embrace Catholicism. God bless.